welcome to another episode of Literary Gladiators, the show where we discuss and debate literature in all of its forms. If it's written work, it's game. Let's meet the panel. How you doing? I'm Larry. I'm Brianna. I'm Charlie. And I'm Josh. Today we're going to be talking about a very interesting work from a very intriguing writer. The Mark on the Wall by Virginia Woolf is what we're talking about today. Excellent. Yep. I will warn everybody that you're going to be on, it, it is quite a thrill ride, but you begin to realize that uh, there is a direction that she's going when, uh, when she's saying what she has to say. Already the... Uh, There's a method to the madness. Mm -hmm. The first question is, uh, what, is the, what, do you, what is the significance of the mark on the wall? Who wants to begin? I guess I will. To me, the mark to me was, it's a point, right, mm. of, uh, it's hard to put it into words what I'm trying to say, but it's, it's just like a, a thing, <laughs> to mm. be eloquent. She mentions that it was, <laughs> uh, I'll quote, uh, black upon the white wall, and then about six or seven inches above the mantelpiece. I would say it's an imperfection to her. I mean, it is a black mark on a, on a white wall above the mantel. I wouldn't, you know, if I have a house, I have a nice, beautiful white wall, and I see this huge mark on my wall, I'm not going to be too happy about that. So uh, maybe she's seeing it as an imperfection to the beauty of the white wall. I say it's just a subject of attention. I agree. That's what I was trying to say. It's just uh, some. It's just one image. Uh, you could look behind us and you could find a subject to uh, look upon, whether it's a bird. There's right a mark on that wall. Yeah, right here. It's not oh as, my good god. It's not as large. Uh, there's another one. Nobody, nobody and there's one there. I can talk about like what this means for an hour. But you can pretty much. Like and then, but then it's not going to be completely about the specific description of that particular mark. It's going to it's going to go on to uh, a philosophy and uh, thoughts about the meaning of life. Yeah. Which that's what every that's just about what everything goes down, comes down to. But in some ways, it does look like it looks like a distract, distraction, but uh, it's n not always going to. Very rarely will it uh, only be about that. And if it was, this would be a very short work. It would just yeah. be her looking, her getting up, her examining it, and there you have it. Yeah. But the, the plot thickens with this. It does thicken, which will lead us into the next question. Why go off on so many unrelated tangents? She's nuts. She might be. I don't know. I think it's just... Uh, she did have some uh, uh, mental issues. Uh, she did end up committing suicide through drowning and it had but a lot of that had to do with the fear of the second world war that was inevitable at the time and it did happen yes and the war the first world war is a major uh major i don't know what, how to say it but it's it's something that comes up again and again in this story is she's she's Afraid obviously unsettled by by the war um <clears throat> so to me, I think what, what it's basically a stream of consciousness, I think, but she's trying to find something to think about that, that is pleasant. So, and that's pretty much what her goal is throughout the course of the story that I saw, is just trying to find something to think about that's nice, pleasant. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that, you know. Uh, we're on the verge of another war, but uh, maybe she's focusing on that mark for a maybe just for peace of mind? I don't really know. Um, I really don't think she's focusing on it, more so that it's just there. It's there. She recognizes it. She, uh, yeah, she, like the, and you know, World War I was almost, was I think even worse than the Second World War, if I'm not mistaken. I had, um, <clears throat> I read somewhere. Um, it was the first modern war. It was definitely the first of its kind, oh, yeah. where you know, you had they so had many people being killed. And because of the uh, modern technology. Right. right. But with regard to why she goes off on these unrelated tangents, she's poking at the fact that this is the way we think. 
we usually, when we're looking at a mark on the wall, it we uh, it takes our mind off something. We're yeah. we're not all. It, we were told to look at one particular object for five minutes. The chances of us going off and thinking about something else that was going on that may have been sparked by that is very likely. I was going to say. Absolutely, yeah, that's why I said too, you know, it's stream of consciousness. But at the same time, she, like, whenever her thoughts seem to get unpleasant, she returns to, uh, to the mark on the wall. Mm -hmm. and she even goes into some detail about that, talking about mm -hmm. how when you wake up uh, from a bad dream, you want, you want, the first thing you do is turn on the lights and take comfort in the fact that you're in your room and you have familiar objects and there are objects that are not uh, not human convention, they exist. Blanky drumsticks. In addition to, uh, with down. regard to the discomfort and thought, uh, she does make a, a point when she discusses, uh, she was shot at the feet of uh, God entirely naked, which uh, then she returns to uh, the mark on the wall, and then she returns to the fact that she's a housekeeper, which that brings about, it's the whole back and forth. Uh, she gives us a, a sample of something extreme that she's thinking about, but then snaps right back to the mark snaps, on the wall, yeah. and then starts again down another train of thought. It, it's pretty much, you have to wake, you're having to wake yourself up from these different uh, what was your uh, take, uh, Ray? It was interesting. And then the, the ending, it was just a snail. Yes, it was wall. a snail, yeah. So, I don't know. It doesn't really have to do with what it really was. It just has to do with what uh, my thoughts and what she... Uh, it does call things into question. Because in the beginning, she's, she's saying, oh, the first time I saw the mark on the wall was earlier this year. Now, how long has that snail been there? Yeah. Or is she still, is she still reminiscing at the end? She was kind of, I don't know, I could just imagine her wherever she was sitting, just thinking all these things, and then someone interrupts her, I'm going to go buy a newspaper, like, she was on, like, I don't know, I could just imagine her going on and on, thinking all these things. The way that she reveals it's a snail, it's, oh, and yeah, that thing on the wall, it was a snail. Mm -hmm. it was, that's the way she gets it's it. Really it's really abrupt. Yeah, yeah, and it's, she doesn't even, she, she never gets up and looks to find out what it is. Mm -hmm. It's whoever she's living with. It just, it's, it, by the end, that's, uh, she figures that one out. No, that's how we, she's told. Yeah, and what's yeah, that smell doing there? <laughs> yeah, what's this? And then she's like, oh, hanging that's around. what the mark on the wall. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, because it's hanging. It's very interesting work. I liked it. Next question. What do you learn about Virginia Woolf after reading this piece? Crazy. I was going to say that, yes. Um, she is, um, she goes off tangent quite a bit, but she always comes back to the mark on the wall, which we have uh, deline delineated as a snail. She, she just always, she's scattermind. It's like she's scatterbrained. On one hand, there's a bit of craziness, but on the other hand, she thinks just, uh, just in a way that most other people think. It's not as if her train of thought is abnormal. That should be taken. Well, Most of us would look at a specific object and we would have different thoughts. Only her, th her ideas were a bit more uh, over the top, just as that's the kind of person she is. Mm -hmm. Well, what, okay. What would you do if you saw a mark on the wall and you didn't know what it was? Would, yeah, you, would, would you find out what it was immediately? Yeah, it. yeah I would go on. I would pick out a baby, taste it a little bit. Well, I'm just kidding. Where, whereas in this story, she she does not want to do that. She does not want to to do that because she seems to have kind of a hopelessness about her. Where she's like, oh, even if I knew what it was, I wouldn't know what it was. Hmm. It's kind of like I you know, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. But at the same time, it's like. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that exactly, except to say that she she says, "Oh yeah, I could just get up and look at it," but you know, she kind of holds uh, men of action in contempt. I think is she doesn't want to, basically. Is that what you're trying to say? She, well, she doesn't want to. No, she doesn't want to. Yeah. Yeah. She'd rather uh, 
speculate about it. Mm. Yeah, she mm. says, if I if I got up and looked at the at the mark, you know, what would that give me knowledge, or would it just give me grounds for more speculation? There are some people uh, they'll find a random mark, and uh, any by the time they're uh, by the time they're interested in going up to look at it, their mind is set on something else. I know a guy named Mark. Most of us do. <laughs> That's true. I'll vouch for that. Anybody have any final thoughts about uh, Mark on the Wall or and or Virginia Woolf? Yeah, I like how she doesn't like, um, she seems to have a longing to think only about nature and the natural world and things that are solid and concrete in reality. Not so much about human uh, invention or convention. Like she keeps breaking up that, uh, that Whitaker's Almanac. So I, I had to look that up because I, I want to know what she's talking about. And it's just a book that comes out once a year in England that talks about different uh, countries and the politics of the countries and the economies. Similar to our Farmer's Almanac, only that uh, concentrates on weather. Right, and this concentrates on different topics as well, but mm. the biggest section is on, uh, is on every country in the world. Mm. And then it's got a write-up of the politics, like the critical essays mm. and things like that. What was it called? Whitaker's Almanac. Almanac. Yes. Um, and she, she says, at one point she's talking about uh, Sunday luncheons and how um, when you're a kid you think that these things are are real like uh, luncheons and etiquette and how you have to have a certain kind of tablecloth yeah. but then as you a certain spoon and a certain fork right but then as time goes on you, you, you kind of realize that, that stuff is not necessarily uh, you know, real. It, it, does, it doesn't it's exist. Like, I don't need a spoon, I'll just do this. Alright, I'll you what, what happens if I use this spoon instead of that spoon? Yeah. Or if I don't go to the luncheon if I don't feel like it, what's gonna happen? Yeah, oh, I can't go to I can't go to your luncheon Mary this week. <gasps> what how dare you? No 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 I, I there's a mark on my wall. I have to take time to look at it. <laughs> right, right. But you know the fact is you know, there's a certain kind of freedom in that. Because you're kind of like you're taking yourself away from uh, from what what is uh, you know cons just you know, thought to be proper or whatever, but yeah. there's no, you know, there's not necessarily any merit to it. I mean, if if, if somebody, if a if a nanny from the 1930s walked in and saw me like this, sit up straight, young man, huh? Who are you, mom? Mm -hmm. What? Sit up straight. This is what you were supposed to do back then. <laughs> that good and fine, but times change, folks. You know, you can put your elbows on the table a little bit and eat with your hands. I got them uh, out of the mark. I like you. The mark on the wall. What I got out of it was a reminder. Something that much most of us don't even notice, but it's going around. It just about all of us do it. <coughs> Only Virginia Woolf really uh, took the effort to doing. experimenting and doing. I know. Yes. That sounded wrong. Cool. Sorry. Already, if you're interested in checking out the work of Virginia Woolf, there is probably an anthology here and there and everywhere. And go to Amazon, you can probably find it there. Google it. You go to your library. Aside from the uh, Norton Anthology Volume F of uh, British uh, literature, uh, or English literature, uh, the world's greatest short stories. It will be, uh, it's in here along with uh, Bartleby the Scrivener that we went over earlier. More cake? Maybe in the future. Okay. Didn't you say there was some Hemingway in there as well? There was, yeah, yeah, there is Hemingway in this uh, collection as well. Uh, my favorite. There is, uh, I will tell you which one. Oh, A Clean, Well Lighted Place by. He's written so many things. Uh, we'll probably go over some of that on the show. But be sure to join us next time for another episode of Literary Gladiators. Until then, keep reading. Have fun with it, too.